she is a lot of the reasons why we are here today. Um, and so Dr. Winfield is an assistant professor at LSU's Manship School of Mass Communication, um, where she is a critical cultural media scholar with a focus on stories, creation, rituals, and practices of black individuals and groups occurring in the media, culture, and society. As a researcher, and she's a filmmaker, she makes films too, they don't sleep on me. <laughs> she aims to use intersectionality, counter narratives, critical race theory, and black feminist thought to frame and center the experiences of black people as they relate to audience reception and meaning making and identity taking. So if y'all give a round of applause for Dr. Winfield. And she's coming on. Restaurant in New Orleans. Mm -hmm. oh. it's okay My mom's right. kitchen. Oh, okay. good. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> no trouble. Um, favorite filming location during the creation of Sisters of Faith? Ooh. The, the night ward. Okay. Um, you want to know why? Yeah. So, towards the end of this project, um, so I come from a background in theater, and um, in theater, when you take on a role, uh, you're encouraged to, you know, study how your character, you know, moves and what they eat and where they live and like their backstory, even if even if you have to create that. Right. So when I was approaching like the end of this production, and as I was approaching post production, I wanted to move to where my family used to be, which was, um, you know, between like the seven ward, eight ward, and nine ward. 
So I moved to the eight ward and the ninth ward when I was wrapping up this film to like finish it. Um, so I think that's why. And like it, it was just like a great, humbling experience that really allowed me to put my soul into the project. Good answer. Good yeah. answer. Come on, ninth ward. Um, favorite camera for still shots? Oh. Um, camera angle for still shots. Oh. Extreme close up portraits. Intimacy. Oh. <laughs> um, favorite camera angle and movement for a dramatic emotional effect. Um, I, you know, I'm in love with like the uh, portrait style push in mm -hmm. when it's being used for like a reveal. So if you watch my work, that's in all of my um, films and music videos and commercials. Um, you know, here it was used. Uh, at the beginning when I said no one ever asked us, you know, how we felt, so I did, and then like it's the slow push it, push in, just like revealing me. Uh, that's kind of something that I, um, I guess I developed that um, out of scarcity almost, because I had to find a way to, you know, create those moments without having a big budget, so, I just thought that, you know, that slow push in, handheld push in, you know, on like a portrait could really like just like establish something and like ground the ground audience. These are not quick answers. I'm so sorry. They, they are not, and that's okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. 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 i am sorry 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 i Amen Corner. That was like that was like one of the first plays I did. <laughs> oh, my like days ball. Sorry, go ahead. Oh no. Okay. Mommy's dancers if anybody's wondering. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Um, favorite song by New Orleans artists. Favorite song by New Orleans artists? Wow. Third World Soldier by Juvenile. Oh, sing. it's in the film. Nah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Who knows it? He friendly. Oh, thank you. Yeah, like Third One Soldier, and uh, I would say, yeah, that's it. Right now. Yeah. Okay. And, and current favorite song is uh, Outside by Flagboy Gizmo. Mm -hmm. I don't appreciate the good talk back. I got some good Amen corners in the music. I'm like, mm -hmm, that's it. That's my jam. And also, Let It Rain by Bishop Paul Les Morton. Really? Yeah. They got some choir members up against something. Yeah. Um, I love that. Yeah. Most underrated city in Louisiana. Ooh. Underrated city in Louisiana. Mm -hmm. Dang. You'll get me in trouble. A lot of trouble today. <laughs> Where y'all from? Underrated city in Louisiana? Mm -hmm. <sighs> I think that, you know, the areas uh, near, um, I think it's like Bashery and um, I think, what is it, like Wallace and stuff like that? Oh, you don't know what it's But yeah, like those areas are like just so cultured. Like, you know, there's like a lot of plantations and, um, you know, many, many well, I guess it's not underrated because like so many things get shot there. Like you know, they shot uh, they shot Beyonce Lemonade there, Django. So maybe it's not underrated, but I think that um, I wish that more people visited those places because like there's just so much soul and culture and stories and history there. Um, most people only use it as a backdrop, you know, for their projects. No shade, but uh, I feel like there's like really like a lot of wisdom and stories there. You know, like from the elders to just like the the you know. Architectural makeup of the place. So, yeah. Bashery? Yeah, I think, I think that's, yeah. When did they shoot Emancipation? Do you know? I, know they I don't them. know. Uh, I didn't see it yet. I don't know. Okay. Yeah. I was trying to tweet with people to let them know I'd be an extra, but they wasn't looking for me. They were looking for something very specific. 100%. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Favorite place in the world to visit outside of the Um, the continent. Uh, I've been to uh, I've been to Tanzania, <coughs> I've been to Nigeria, and I'm trying to go to Ghana next. Okay. So I would.
would say Tanzania. I want to go back to Tanzania. Beautiful. Beautiful. Humbling. I stayed there for two weeks. Favorite pair of shoes <coughs> would be dang, these. Okay. <laughs> One of my friends made them. Um, black guy from New Orleans named uh, Jelani. Shoe preserve on Instagram. His father, I mean his grandfather, was a shoe designer and craftsman. Um, a very like great great grandfather. Mm -hmm. And uh, now he works. <laughs> he works at Easy. You know, for Kanye West, you know, designing and creating concepts and blueprints for shoes, and this is his brand. So this is my favorite pair of shoes. And and he's younger than me, like he's like 24. Okay. J Line. J Line. Shout out to J Line. J E L A N I. That's a good shout out. Yeah, y'all both heard of J Line. Yeah. Um. Okay, now this is one from the lab. Okay, so I hope you don't get in trouble. We're going into the, the or questions, this or that, okay? Okay. And then we're going to go into the, the other questions. <coughs> Canon or Polaroid? Uh, I'm going to say Canon. Okay. I'm going to say Canon because uh, the first camera I ever owned was a Canon T2i. It's what I started shooting this film on. So. I'm gonna say Canon, but like love the Polaroid, but ain't nobody sponsoring me right now, so I'm, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Not yet, but it's coming, okay? Uh, Saints versus the Falcons. Come on. <laughs> I know that I have on like red right now, but this is not a Falcon. This is the Sankofa. Uh, so it's who that nation all day, baby. Like I can't, I can't. Who that? Yeah, I stand on that. You know, I can only come, I can only show up as myself, you know. <laughs> Were you gonna do the chance? I like it's funny. Um, I actually shoot a lot in Atlanta, and at at the end of all my sets, you know, I always just show love to everybody. But I always make um the set say who that who that in Atlanta. Good. Like I, I I just love it. It just it it's so painful for me. <laughs> <That's> okay. <laughs> who that? Yeah. That's impressive. Yes. Okay. Jambalaya or gumbo? Gumbo. Mm -hmm. East Bank or West Bank? Come on now. Who are these disrespectful questions? I mean, <laughs> so East Bank and West Bank, you know, um, and I always have this conversation like I'm tied to both mm -hmm. because because of some family trauma and some family drama, um, we we left the East Bank when I was you know like very young. So, but all the rest of my family still stayed on the East Bank, but my sister and I, we grew up mainly like on the, you know, on the West Bank. Mm -hmm. So I love both sides, you know, and I really hope that people stop pinning them against each other because just to be honest, the first people that settled, uh, you know, in New Orleans was in Elgin's, mm -hmm. you know, so uh, I like, I love both and they both, you know, offer something great. Yeah. Both is a good answer. Hole in the wall or fine dining? Hole in the wall. Canal Street or Bourbon Street? Uh, Canal Street. <laughs> <laughs> this the uh for this? Yeah. Okay. I'm gonna skip that one. Okay. Um, in front of the camera or behind the camera? Behind the camera. 90s R&B or 2000? Ooh. <laughs> Ooh. Dang. Say it again. That's hard. I, nah, I pass. Like, <laughs> yeah, Those that's hard. Because uh, 90s was so crazy. But then 2000s was just like, that's just like, I, I remember just running around the neighborhood and people had their radios in their windows playing, you know, Ashanti and all that. Like, you know what I'm saying? So I, that's hard. That's hard. <coughs> A little jagged edge for the people. You know what I'm saying? Yes. Yeah, that's hard. We'll pass it. Coffee or tea? Tea. Super Sunday or Super Bowl? Super Sunday! <laughs> <laughs> yes. It's only, it's like, it's, 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 it's only one Super Sunday and it ain't a Super Bowl. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Super Sunday, like super, super, super Sunday. Actually, uh, 
the uh, down, yeah, downtown Super Sunday is this Sunday. So yeah, Super Sunday all the way. All the way. Yeah. Okay, thank you. For like, our Super Sunday, Sunday over Mardi Gras. Oh, like, amazing. just to be honest. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> There's some people from New Orleans in here who have thoughts. I can feel it. That's all. <laughs> Yes, um, the first time that I picked up a camera, I was in high school. Um, no, actually, it was it was before high school. Like because my mom is like the person that you know documents everything in the family, in, like like informally though. It's not it's not it's just like a hobby more so. And uh, when like she was younger, she lost like a lot of photos. Uh, I can't remember how, but like she lost like a lot of photos. So like she don't even know what she looks like as a baby. Uh, so ever since then, she was like, you know, I I'm never gonna allow that to happen again, which is why I, I was able to have so much archival of my family in Katrina babies, because uh, most, of, most of my family, especially Tina, they lost all of their photos, so my mom had backups and duplicates of everything, um, and stuff she had never seen before, from like funeral programs to graduation programs, so, you know, we always tease my mama for being like a hoarder, but it really showed up and made sense for this project and like just for like right now. So, um, you know, it was her camera. That was the first camera I picked up. She had the yeah, camera that was in the film. Um, it was a camcorder. And, um, you know, I was using it to do what teenagers do, you know, film fights. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, there's a fight in Katrina Babies of my two cousins fighting and like that was me filming it. You know, like you know, just trying to get the right angle, but I was practicing for this. You know, I I, I did this for y'all. <laughs> yeah, and then and then me and my friends started making skits, <laughs> like just crazy skits that we wound up having to take off YouTube because it, it it just would have been a PR nightmare. <laughs> but we were young, so uh, yeah, it was the camcorder. Good. I know we were talking last night at dinner with the lab um, about what research is and what your mom is doing to research. Yeah. I'm actually working on getting her stuff um, preserved and archived um, because she had so much like, uh, she brought like this trash bag to my crib of just like all type of old stuff. And like she has like this photo of Muhammad Ali that's signed by Ali wow. and Minister Farrakhan. Wow. Mm -hmm. And it was just tore up, so I framed it and you know, put it in my apartment. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> you know? You know, I just, story, you know, story was all I ever had. Uh, we talked about this last night, you know, so often um, I think that in these spaces of media and, you know, for me, film, I didn't have a blueprint, I didn't have the access, I didn't have the resources, you know, I didn't have anyone to look up to until, like, I was already, you know, like, 18 or 19, so, all I had was my neighborhood. All I had was like the stories that, you know, um, I knew from experiencing them. So it was me allowing my experience, as y'all said yesterday, to be data. You know, it was allowing, yeah, it was allowing like the stories that I had gathered and heard, you know, to be data and to be, you know, their content. So. I just led with story. You know, as I said, I started I, I started making this documentary with a Canon T2i. And at first I was stressing myself out about that because I would see some of my counterparts who, you know, had this fancy equipment 
thousand dollar cameras and like all I had was a Canon T2i that's not even a film camera, it's a photo camera that shoots video. And then one day, um, I was sitting down, um, I was sitting down with Spike Lee. That, that's not a flex, yo, I swear. But <laughs> I was sitting down with Spike Lee because I was interning for him um, at Dillard. And you know he was just like, let story lead you. Lead with story, don't worry about all the other stuff, lead with story. And then my, and then my mentor, Chike Oza, you know, he told me the same thing, you know, don't worry about all that, you know, uh, 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 fancy equipment and, and like all of that, mm -hmm. just lead with story. Like, your story is gonna change your whole life. Yeah. So that's what I did, you know, I, I trusted my story, I made sure that the people of my community trusted me with their stories, mm -hmm. and I let that lead. And, you know, even to this day, when I'm in position to where I could afford the equipment and I can get the equipment and I get the best crews you know, from anywhere, story is still my focus, you know? Mm, that's good. Good answer. <laughs> okay. Um, I think you said something I want to, like, kind of piggyback off of as far as, like, having the community trust you with their stories. And we do the same thing at Reflex. Like, we go to them and ask them questions and ask them to share the space with us, share their moment, share their lived experience. So did you have anybody in the process of making the film that was like, I'm absolutely not ready yet, but when I first told my grandmother that I was making a film called Katrina Baby, she was like, boy, don't nobody want to hear that no more. Like, literally, like, you know, that was her. But I understood, you know, um, because my grandmother had experienced so much with that storm and, you know, it was just uh, triggering to even just hear that her grandson wanted to make a film about it. You know, because obviously, you know, when I went to her telling her that, it was because, like, I wanted her to be in it. Um, and you know, she was like, you know, we already heard that story. And that was a moment, like a very important moment for me because I went on for the next seven, eight years. I mean, even to this day, you know, hearing that, you know, I was at Rebrand the other day, uh, you know, getting a rental car. <laughs> and, uh, and the guy who was helping me, one of his workers came up and he was like, uh, he was like, man, you own some Katrina babies? You know, and the guy doesn't know that I'm the person who directed it. And he's like, man, I, I don't want to see that. I don't want to see that stuff, S word. Like, you know, I don't want to see that, you know, like the pressing A, S. And he was like, why would I want to watch that? And then the guy was like, hey, hold on, bro. Like, before you say anything else, this is the, the director. He was like, no. <laughs> But I told him, I was like, bro, I, I understand. I get it, you know. Um, so, yes, that did happen, but I understand it. Just like I understand people who don't want to watch the film. You know, some of my closest friends, closest family members have not watched the film. You know, like my uncle thought that I was gonna be upset because he didn't come to my uh, my uh, premiere, but I understand, you know, he went through so much during like Hurricane Katrina that just to even watch it is triggering. So uh, yes, of course, there were many people that were just like, look, I love you, but I, I just can't do it. Mm -hmm. But it was never a, 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 a situation where somebody didn't trust me to do it. You know, cause like I, you know, I made a good name for myself in my community. There was a moment today, and I think maybe some of y'all were there. Um, earlier today, you were able to talk to the high school students. Mm -hmm. And it ooh, was so precious. <laughs> um, and I think something that you did with them, you also did with the people in the in the documentary, right? Like you took time and you listened to everybody's story, right? Mm -hmm. And even if there was a student who was like a little disengaged, he wasn't ready to say anything. He was like, hey, man, you. And I was like, yes, that's it. That's yeah. the high school teacher in you. Um, but what is it like for us to center the experiences of the youth, to not erase them, to act like they don't exist, but to say, no, I want to talk to you? What was that like for you? I think that because so much of my work is dedicated to the youth and, you know, the young, and, 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 and young people are involved with so much of my work. My company is called House of the Young Entertainer. Mm -hmm. And... I think that it started when I was a young person and I felt like I didn't have those outlets and I felt like I didn't have those spaces where I could just express how I felt or, you know, I didn't have those outlets, you know, to like, you know, of, of, of expression. So once I got of age, I wanted to create them, not just for like young people, but I was, you know, when I created House of the Young at 18, I was creating that for myself too, you know, because uh, I felt like we didn't have those spaces. So once I became a documentary, well, once I became a filmmaker, you know,
just like everything else, the youth were censored. Um, you know, in my in my in my approach. Uh, so I think that what it was like. Um, I'm just doing stuff that wasn't done for me. You know, um, I'm trying to make sure that this these new generations and like these new um, you, well, younger students and, and and younger people don't have to deal with what my peers and I had to deal with. Because like, let's just be honest. The yeah, conversation of healing and the conversation of wellness and mental health, spoken out loud, is new. Like I didn't hear nobody talking about that when I was younger. Right. You know, I didn't hear like I, I didn't see people, you know, in my community talking about you know how we felt. You know what I'm saying? So now that we have the opportunity to do that, we can't just focus on the adults. We have to make sure that we start with the children and those who were children when it didn't exist, because like we have so much suppressed. So um, I think that like I, I do that work because it's also like a part of my experience, and I'm trying to do a lot of healing as well. Mm. Yeah. Oh, that's good. That's good. I hope that answers your question. Yeah. I'll be going all around the world sometimes. <laughs> we made it to the destination. Um, just following up with that, right? So you talk about in the film, and I know we didn't get to see everything that you were a high school teacher and you were teaching media. And I'm wondering if there were any experiences in the classroom that helped you as far as like creating this film and the stories that you wanted to tell. Absolutely, the whole, the entire film changed once, once I became a high school teacher. I never planned on being a teacher. Mm -hmm. So after college, uh, I went to Dillard. And after college, um, I'll never forget it. At, at graduation, the uh, the uh, president was doing a shout out. So, um, and, you know, he had reached out to me in advance to ask me, like, you know, what I wanted my shout out to be and what was next for you. And, like, you know, Denzel Washington was our speaker or whatever. Um, That's cute. Yeah, well, sort of sort of viral video of, like, Denzel giving, like, that uh, that uh, commencement speech. That That's my graduation. Oh, um, and that changed me so much, like, that speech. Like, in that speech, I was like, oh, I'm going to make it. Like, he just fired me up, like, but anyway, um, in the shadow, he was like, well, I was like, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go off and be a PA on movie sets, and I'm gonna work my way up to being an AD, and then somehow I'm gonna network and meet another director who's gonna make me a director, and I'm gonna be working on Katrina Babies at the same time. So that was my plan. Uh, so two, two weeks after I graduated, I got a call from a high school principal at Elgis Technology Academy. Her name was uh, Naya Mitchell. She actually lives here, I believe. And she, she had just saw my film that had went to the uh, Cannes Film Festival. And she was like, I would love to create a space, you know, at this school where kids can learn digital media and film. I was like, I don't want to be no teacher. You know, like, I'm, I'm, I was like 23, whatever. And I still took the interview, and you know, once they told me how much they was paying, I was like, uh, you know, yeah, like I'll do it, whatever. Like, uh, you know, like, you know, people say that, like, well, and like teachers don't make enough, right. but when you're 23, <laughs> you know, uh, it, it was enough. But as soon as I got in the classroom, I understood why I was there. I understood that this is nothing about, you know, the money. This is nothing about um, me. It was like these are the real Katrina babies, cause like I had just started working on Katrina babies a few months before. So <clears throat> when I got into that classroom and it was just hard, you know, like just seeing like what the students were dealing with, how they were acting towards me, I was like, oh, this is why I'm here. Like I need to be here in order to really, truly tell this story. So uh, I taught for four, four and a half years. Um, and some of some of the people in the film, like Kelvin and Chantrell Parker, and um, even some of the people that are like behind the lens, like two of my students, uh, Joshua Williams and uh, Yancy Young. Yancy just passed away about two weeks ago, actually, and they helped me interview my mom. Like, well, no, they, sorry, they didn't help me. They 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 filmed me interview my mom. So, you know, my high school experience was. You know, it it was life changing for this film. Like this film wouldn't be what it is without those students and without that experience. Yeah. I love that. I'm almost done with me, so we can hear. I'm really almost done with me, mm -hmm. so we can hear what you do. So I I'll, I'll go to the very last question. How about that? So there are some academic storytelling.
storytellers in the building. They are um, filmmakers, future filmmakers. There are storytellers in the room. If there is any advice that you can give to them based on your own lived experiences in front of and behind the camera, what advice would that be? I think that my advice to you all is, you know, I understand that we didn't occupy these spaces, you know, for very long and we weren't even let in for very long. We was talking about this last night. Um, so sometimes that means that we don't have like the same access, like the same resources. Um, you know, <coughs> and I think that it's important that we do use what we have. You know, in the conversation we had yesterday, you know, our story, our experience is enough. You know, that's our data. You know, when I was working on this project, you know, there were some people on this project who were just so experienced and they had did the most prestigious Oscar and Emmy Award winning, you know, films and stuff <coughs> like that. And like they, they would challenge me sometimes. They'd be like, okay, well, you know, like, where's the data? You know, like, where is the, like, who are you to say that? And then one of my producers, Audrey R Rosenberg, you know, and GK Oza said to me, yo, your life story is your experience. You know, like, your, your, no, I'm sorry, it's your data. Your experience is your data. So, you know, I started saying that all the time. Me and husband back and forth, I'm like, my experience is my data. Like, you know, <laughs> like but, but it's true. You know, because like for like a long time, especially in New Orleans, like I was just talking about this today, you know, a lot of our data was lost or like not documented, you know, so, um, you know, I think that it's important that we continue to do what we do and like don't get discouraged because, you know, we may not have the same access, resources or respect as people who are, have been doing it for so long and people who have been you know, grandfathered in, right? right, right. <laughs> Um, so I think that it's important that we use what we have and, you know, use who we have and, like, don't turn away from our communities and, our, and, and, and you know, ourselves when it comes to feeling like, you know, we belong in these spaces. So, you know, I, I hope that's good. That was that's what I did. <laughs> that's what I did. <laughs> some questions from you all in the audience. And so, uh, if you have a question, raise your hand, uh, introduce yourself and tell, uh, tell us your major, your affiliation at LSU, um, if you are affiliated, and let's ask your question. I'll start with you right here. Oh. Hey, my name is Jade. I don't go Yeah, um, I think that I think that if if I had a bigger budget, I probably wouldn't have changed anything that's on screen picture wise. But I think that uh, I would have like gotten some of like. Well, first of all, I did get most of my dream songs. You know, I got like the Third World Soldier by Juvenile Man and Fresh. I got the T.L. Barrett. Nobody knows. I got the Frank Ocean Higgs. But that was because like they just really loved the project and like they just gave us a crazy discount. But I think that uh, I had like a big wish list of like, um, you know, 
uh, songs for the soundtrack that like I would have like maybe added into it. I probably wouldn't, ch- wouldn't change anything picture wise. Like you know, this film is beautiful. It's 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 imperfect. It's not like traditional. It's mixed mediums and formats, and like I think that that's what makes this film so great because like you you're really on like a journey of like not just you know Katrina did it, but you're really on like a journey of me as a filmmaker because like when I first picked up that T2I. I didn't really know what I was doing. So you, you kind of see me evolve as a filmmaker over the seven years if you really pay attention. Um, but something that I would have did with that budget was I would have put more money towards an impact plan. Uh, Cause like right now we're working on an impact plan um, to you know change the conditions and like address some of the conditions that we address in the film. And we want to like change what's happening like on the ground in New Orleans um, and like really just be a resource. Uh, so I would have like put like a lot of money towards impact and you know having more spaces like these um, so that's what we're doing right now. Uh, my name is Ethan. I am a freshman film and television student. Uh, what was the thought process behind incorporating the uh, animation into the film? Great question. Um, so animation was something that my mentor and I have been exploring. So Cootie and Chike are two, uh, they're a directing duo. And uh, Chike is from Uptown in the third wall of Jackson's, you know, <laughs> he, 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 he just be rapping, so I gotta rap for him. That's okay. You know, he's, he, he's, uh, you know, he's from Uptown, and Cootie is from Chicago. They um, are like, just like two legends in my eyes. Like, you know, many people always think that, you know, Spike, like people like Spike Lee and Tyler Perry gave me my inspiration to make films, but it was really Cootie and Chike. Uh, they just finished up a, uh, a, a, like pretty much the biggest documentary on Netflix, uh, which is Genius by Kanye West. Um, and you know, those are my mentors, those are like the uh, EPs on this project. And over the years, they've been the ones kind of like checking in on me, um, trying to make sure that like, I finish this project. And they often use animation in their previous work. So they, they did a documentary called Benji, uh, that's a 30 for 30. And you know, I just love like the way that animation was you know, able to uh, work in that film. So when we were talking about post production about four years ago, GK was like, man, animation would be great in your film. And like, I agreed as well because these stories are so heavy, one. Um, and then also, there's like, things were lost, mm-hmm. right? So, you know, going back to the first point though of, 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 of things being so heavy, animation has a way of allowing viewers to empathize mm-hmm. more. It, 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 it makes you more like receptive, if you will, mm-hmm. um, of the information that's 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 coming your way. So there are like specific parts that we wanted to do that on. So I knew that in the first, you know, 20 minutes, I had to ground the audience. And if I'm gonna talk about my family, I'm not gonna just show, you know, you know, me as, you know, your child, but maybe what I happened, we can use animation to like really ground you in what my childhood was like. So once we get into what I lost, you know what I lost. And like you know it from a whole different level because you saw that animation. So that was like just some of like the uh, thought processes uh, behind it. When it comes to the style, uh, I'm a f- big fan of fine art. I'm an art collector. Chike is an art collector, <coughs> and we talk about art a lot. And we've been following uh, this an- this animator and illustrator, Anthony Sindra. He lives in Spain, um, and I always said that like once I get enough money, I'm gonna hire him for something. I didn't know it was gonna be Katrina Baby. So as soon as we got the money. Uh, well, actually, in the HBO pitch, I told them that we were going to use him, and I hadn't even spoken to him. Um, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, HBO. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, and like that's kind of what made like you know in the pitch they were so stoked about the animation. I was like, yo, you're gonna do animation? I was like, yeah, I'm gonna do animation. <laughs> you know, and um, we reached out to Anthony, and it was the pen, like you know, it's still a pandemic, but it was at the beat. So. I made this deal at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, And we had reached out to Anthony and all of the work was done virtually, you know, over Zoom, over, you know, uh, emails, over text messages. So that goes to show you just how talented and, you know, just like receptive he was and like empathetic he was because would y'all say he did a great job? You know, he did a great job and like that took like a lot of communication, a lot of, yelling, <laughs> like not not at each other, but just with each other and a lot of research. Um, so that's like one of my favorite pieces of this for sure. And like I definitely plan to use animation again in the future. 
questions from us? Yes. Hi, my name is Ivory. I'm from New Orleans. I'm with Xavier, so you're with Dillard. So come, oh. come from Crosstown. Um, oh, no. Oh, no, it's love. I just finished oh. the project with, uh, like, you go see, like, a, I got a big project coming out with Xavier soon. Okay, cool, cool, cool. Yeah. Um, but, like, you know, shout out to you. Shout out to the university. Come on. Where's the camera? Is the camera right here? <laughs> like, shout out to the university. Come on. Yeah. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm a master's student with the Manship uh, School of Mass Town. But my question for you, um, you talked about it in the film and kind of, you already mentioned it, but being with the high schoolers and how they had a sense of normalcy different coming up with Katrina, how did you battle that with your change and sense of normalcy from having that family, that neighborhood, right before the storm hit, having to go through that and now having to teach and mold with that? So how did that, how did that become impacted if there were like any conflicts while you were doing the film? I mean, Ask that question, Sean. No, 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 no. I, I want to make sure that I got answered it right. Like, how did your like sense of normalcy? How did you have to deal with that in what your childhood was versus the child, the the youth that you had to impact when you were doing this film? So you know, what? with Katrina, like my sense of normalcy was like completely shattered because mm -hmm. like your mom kept everything. I have no baby photos. Mm -hmm. The youngest photo I have is like mm -hmm. five, and then from five, I don't have another photo until I'm like in middle school. Mm -hmm. All of it is gone. And so that I had to form a new sense of normalcy, kind of like if you had to form it. And in doing so, when you came back and you were teaching you, like how did you have to battle some of the conflict or like merge some of the two to in your storytelling process? Well, you know, because I was 13 when the storm hit, I still remember a lot about pre-Katrina in New Orleans. I still remember a lot about what it was like growing up, um, you know, in my childhood and what I, the biggest conflict was just the identity issues that my students were dealing with. You know, yeah, I was dealing with like a sense of normalcy, but they were dealing with not knowing what, you know, like who they were, like where they came from. And you already deal with that as a child, but you know, I saw this trend in New Orleans where, you know, people were naming themselves after two neighborhoods, right? So like, you know, growing up, you would be like, you know, I'm from the third world, I'm from the West Bank, I'm from 1.5, I'm from the sixth world, like the seventh world, whatever. But, but after Katrina, like one of the things that like, I noticed was how many students would be like, oh, I'm from the ninth ward and the fourth mm -hmm. ward. So like, ride four nine, yeah. right? And are, you know, children being from like the Elger, Elgers and from uptown. And it was because like they were moving around so much and they were never living in one place, whether it was because they were being kicked out or because the neighborhood was changing and rent was going up, right? Um, and that does a lot to a child, like moving around so much, you know, um, and like it does a lot to the, their um, identity. And that shows up in the classroom in many different ways, you know, because like if you don't know who you are, how do you know where you're going, right? Or like where you stand or, you know, so that was one of the biggest things that like, you know, um, you know I had to fight was this sense of normalcy, normalcy that I knew about New Orleans that kind of kept me grounded after the storm because I was like, well, you know what? It, although although it's not the same, my sense of normalcy before the storm kind of kept me optimistic and hopeful. So, you know, I could stay grounded. But like with my students, I was fighting a changing New Orleans. So yes, I can come into class and preach to them and inspire them and you know I could hire them and do all like you know all of these things to like keep them grounded. But then. I'm fighting their neighborhoods. You know, I'm, you know, I'm, my biggest competition was, you know, the uh, community, you know, and how not, and, 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 and like, just like how abnormal it was, you know what I'm saying? It, 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 it was a constant battle, you know, because like, I might have a student feeling great one day and, you know, I may have spoken with him or her and, you know, we may have worked on a great project together, but then like the next day, it like sometimes it just felt like I was starting from scratch with them because it's like once they go home, you know. So I hope that answers your question. Like, oh, that's good. That's good. Yeah. I, like I'm from there, so it's like everything you're saying, I feel exactly. Yeah, the same. yeah. So and, and and then as time went on, you know, so the better New Orleans got, like in my opinion, the better New Orleans got from like. I guess like a rebuilding standpoint or like you know it being ready and you know tourists ready and whatever the worst it got for us 
you know, like the worst it got for like the locals than like where we were, you know, because most of the time there wasn't really space for us. And that showed up in the class, like, you know, kids moving around so much and not really knowing like where they were from or where they were going, literally. Like they don't know if they're gonna be changing schools like the next day. So yeah, it's, it's it was tough to deal with. It, it was real tough to deal with. Like when I was a young younger student, uh, I mean a uh, younger teacher, uh, I remember like I wanted to move like I wanted to like mentor and move so many kids like like and this will sound weird but like I, I just wanted to mentor and like move so many kids in with me because like I knew like what they was going through at home and like my mentor was like you can't do that <laughs> you know but like it was just it was just so much going on you know and like I was like they are not safe. Um, let me get uh, you in the green here and I'll get uh, you back here in the black um, and then we'll wrap up if that's that's okay. Mm -hmm. Is that what you're going? Right. I understand. Well, part of the women community as well. The question I have is probably a really small question, but like, what was your journey like figuring out the story and like how did that reflect each part of production, like for you to all of that? Well, I think that part of the reason uh, that this film took so long, outside of the fact that these stories were real and still unfolding. And augmentation um, was me trying to figure out what was the story that I wanted to tell. Like, what was the solid story? I knew the stories, right? I knew the the uh, themes. I knew some of the through lines. Um, no, sorry, I didn't. I didn't know the uh, through line. Um, but one of the hardest pieces was like making like one cohesive, solid story because like this could have been a series easily, uh, but because we didn't want to do like take that direction, one of the most complicated parts of like being an independent filmmaker, because like again, like for the first five years I didn't have a team. But one of the most complicated things of being like an independent filmmaker and like also again, you know, not really like having like the resources and tools was like finding a cohesive story. You know, and like and 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 and, and following it. You know, because like I was so close to it. Like this is my life. You know, so it was going from left to right all the time. Like things were happening in my personal life that was impacting the story, and then things were happening in the film that I felt like was changing how I interacted with my city. So it took me a very long time to like really narrow it down and like really focus on like what I you know needed to focus on. And it didn't change until I inserted myself into the story. Um, so as y'all watch the film, you may think that it was always you know, the idea for me to be in the film. But I worked on this film for seven years. I didn't insert myself into the film until year five. Like, so every everything was already shot. And I was always resistant towards being in the film because I didn't believe that, like, I had a story. I had survivor's guilt because I evacuated. So I was like, I'm not gonna put myself in this story next to people who were really in that water. Like, you know, cause like, my students used to always say, man, I was really in that water. You know, and you know, so I was like not taking my trauma into consideration until I got into the footage and when the pandemic set me down and I got that call from Chief K and like he was telling me that Time Studios of Time Magazine wanted to meet with me, you know, to talk about, you know, producing a movie and I had to sit down with 400, 500 hours of footage and just watch it straight through. And I was being impacted in ways that I had never really felt. And I was like, wow, like I, I did it. I accomplished the goal of asking the children how they felt, but then I realized, wait, nobody asked me. Mm -hmm. And you know, when I said that, you know, everybody on the team was like, oh, that's it, bro, that's <laughs> it, that's the story, you know? And when, and like when I was working on a sample reel, I didn't have anybody else to narrate it because like, you know, it's the pandemic and like it, it's at the beginning. And so I narrated my sample reel myself. And like when I sent it to my team, they was like, this is it. And that's when the whole through line came. So like part of the reason that I couldn't find my through line and couldn't find the you know connective tissue of this story was because I was being so resistant to being in it. But as soon as I inserted myself into the film and like trusted, you know, my team and trusted the world as the world had trusted me, that's when the whole story came together.
I was telling y'all yesterday, like, part of the reason that I, I even move how I move when I'm on tour, because, you know, I've been, like, I, I've been showing this film so much lately, I, um, you know, especially, like, this month. Uh, but I have to take care of myself while I do this work. Um, it's, like, really important so that I can be beneficial to you all, like, you know, for real. Because, like, last year, th like, things moved so fast. Like, when the trailer for Katrina Babies came out, Everything started moving fast, like press, you know, coverage, touring, like, you know, like people just walking up to me telling me like horrible things about what they had, you know, had experience and looking at me as like the savior almost, right? And that on top of just, you know, <laughs> being black in America <laughs> and, um, and like working on other projects, I didn't have that balance. So, by December, I was exhausted. Like literally, like I think I got sick like four or five times at the end of the year last year. So I took some time off and I wasn't doing any any press, I wasn't doing any screens, and I got myself right. You know, I started working out, I started eating better, and I started, you know, like really just like focusing on healing and like, you know, different outlets that allow me to, you know, heal. And you know, it, and like it's still a balance, you know. So, I think that in order to be who I am, you know, for this process and like for this project, I had to ground myself um, and like not, not you know, like not feel like, you know, I had to do and be everything just because I made this film. Mm -hmm. Like me making this film, that's my contribution. What y'all gonna do? Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. no seriously. Like because it's like you know, I, I was at a school last week and I got a question. And he asked me, you know, you know, what more are you gonna do, you know, to like really address what's happening in New Orleans? And like, I am gonna do more, but it can't just be on me. Mm -hmm. Like, I, I'm a filmmaker. Like, this is my contribution to the conversation, to the to the impact. Now, what are you gonna do? Once I understood that, it it really, really, really took a lot of weight off of me because like, for, like, I worked on this. Like, I got this idea when I was 20. I started when I was 23, mm -hmm. and I rapped picture and like rapped this film when I was 30. Mm -hmm. So I spent all my 20s working on this. Wow. You know, like like I grew up with this film. I raised this film. You know, no, no, I'm sorry. Like this film has raised me in the same way that I raised it. You know, so um, once I realized that I didn't have to carry like the weight alone, and like this is my contribution, that's when I was able to ground myself and like really just be better and happier. You know. Yeah, hey, um, you know, I love the film. Um, I'm Justin Newell, I'm an MFA actor here. And I'm at GA for uh, film and television, so a few of my students are here. So I resonate with your students helping you make a project. I wanted to know, like a technical question, like did you shoot all the interviews first and then go back and do the script? And I guess the second yeah. part to that question is, how much were you intentional about what you were doing and how much, I guess, improvisational, how much did you allow other things to morph Mostly, so I was intentional about, <laughs> I was intentional about just letting it happen and winging it, like, you know, for a very long time, because again, I didn't know what I was doing, but I knew what I wanted, like, I knew that I wanted to tell a story about the young people who experienced Hurricane Katrina. Yeah. Did I know that the, the uh, through line would wind up being me? No. Did I know that, you know, a lot of the moments that y'all feel heavily in the film, like you know those 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 gut punches, they were real gut punches for me in the process. So like for example, when I sat down with Maisha and like you know she says no one ever asked me about this, like you know that's why I'm crying, like you know or like when I asked her, I'm sorry, why haven't you ever spoken about this? And she said I don't know, no, no one ever asked me. That's like such a big moment in the film, but that wasn't planned. Mm -hmm. Like that that was when I really realized oh. I'm talking to people for the first time. So, I, yeah, yes, I really, you know, I tried to plan this film at the beginning and like do an outline and I had my index cards and you know, I was walking up to the sets with my little papers and checking, but they had those moments that really set me down and like made me put those things down and just like let things happen, you know? And that's what this film is, you know? Um, and there were moments in the process that I did have to ground some things and structure some things. So. You know, once I had interviewed most of, you know, my community, 
because I hate calling these subjects. Like, once I interviewed m most of my community and my friends and my family, I had to like really sit down and really do an outline and a script so that I could know how I wanted to structure it. One, structure the edit, but two, what like what more I had left because it got to a point where I was like, man, I don't know when I will ever be finished making this project. So I had to like really sit down and like create that script. I'll say this though, now moving forward, every project that I'm gonna do, I'm gonna create a script for it at the beginning. But I'm gonna be graceful with it as well to allow things to just happen. Like I'm not gonna just only stick to the script and only stick, you know, uh, uh, stick to the outline, especially in documentary filmmaking, because you can't do that because that's not how real life works. You know, like somebody could pass away. Somebody could, uh, 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 you know, not want to do it no more because they can't take it. Like, you know, something that's like turning could, like, that's that's turning and yeah, a turning point could happen, mm -hmm. right? So you do yourself a disservice in, in, you know, in the world of documentary when you try to, you know, just be so, like, just, I, I guess, like, stuck on one structure or outline or, or, or you know, Especially if it's not about you, like this was about my community, so it would have been selfish for me to have my agenda and my own intentions and try to like you know lead, you know like lead my interviews and lead them to say things. You know, I I left it open and and the film is better for it. Thank you. I'm really intentional about wearing this shirt. You know, this is this is the Sankofa, uh, which means you know to go back and get it. Um, and like I wear this shirt a lot. You know, like I'm not dirty, y'all, but like <laughs> I wear this shirt a lot. And you know, and I'm intentional about it. Like it's 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 my favorite shirt. Um, it was made by uh, Kirby Raymond of uh, Pierre Moss, and um, that. You know, that bird and like that saying just means so much to me because it's really what Katrina Baby's process was. Mm -hmm. You know, it was to go back and get it because when Katrina happened, the conversations and like the spaces that we have now didn't exist. The camera phone wasn't even really a thing, you know, like there was no way for us to advocate for ourselves, right? So when these conversations are happening, you know, about justice and like, when all of these, you know, um, these 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 movements are happening about things that are inhumane, I was like, we gotta go back to Katrina and like get that story, you know, because it's like never really been advocated for. It. So the past was everything, you know, um, and not even just 2005, but even before Katrina, you know, uh, because like we're dealing with it's a generational trauma. You know, after my dad watched the film for the first time, and I've never seen my father cry ever, mm -hmm. and he cried at at our Tribeca watching the film, and I was and like, I was like, I was even watching the film. I, I was like, how does this dude look when he cries? Like, you know, like, like is it an ugly cry? Is it like, you know, like that that one Denzel teardrop, whatever? <laughs> but like, I was, you know, I was just looking like, man, this dude is really crying. But like, it it was smooth, like you know, it was it was a little player cry, you know, he was just chilling like. Whatever. Yeah, the thug tears, like, you know, whatever. So, and he said something to me that has everything to do with the past. He was like, you know, he was like, man, I'm sorry, or whatever. And, like, I stopped him right there. I was like, when I say, no, no, you know, nobody ever asked us, let's make it clear. I'm not talking about our parents. Because, like, they are a part of a system that doesn't even allow them the tools and the resources to know how to talk to their children. Or, like, you know, ask if they're okay, right? So, I was just like, and like he was like, you know, you're right. I never asked you about Katrina, like, you know, and I never asked you about Hurricane Katrina because nobody ever asked me about Hurricane Betsy. Wow. Wow. You know, and like that happened to him when he was a child. Mm -hmm. You know, so the past has everything to do with now. You know, if we don't know where we come from, and like if we don't go back and address certain things and get certain things, it'll, 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 you know, we're doomed because at the end of the day, people are carrying like the past with them. When you suppress trauma, you're carrying the past with you now. 
you know? So it has everything to do with it. Two more ones. Two more. Sweet, it's your chance. He's sitting right in front of you. <laughs> Burning thoughts. I was gonna say, if you can go back and like do anything over again, what would you do? Or if you would, why? I would like, I would give myself grace with this project. <laughs> I was so hard on myself in my twenties with this project, man. Like so hard, you know. Um, I didn't do any like, you know, like right now, you know. I, I, I well, no, like, like, like last year I partied a lot, and like, you know, I even like, you know, I party sometimes now because like when I was making this project, I was in like I was straight on this project, you know. Um, I didn't really party in college much, um, you know, other than like the events that I put on myself. Um, to support this project, like I used to do events to you know to uh, support Katrina Davis. So everything was revolving around Katrina Davis, and like I was just so hard on myself because I didn't have the resources and the access and the contacts, and I just felt like you know why am I doing this? You know where is this film you know going to take me? You know, um, and I like beat myself up a lot while I was making this project when something didn't go my way or. Whatever, and I think that like if I can go back and do it again, I would have just give myself more grace and be more gentle and kind of myself uh, while I was making this because exploring such heavy topics and then not being not being uh you know kind to yourself and gentle with yourself that's a lot you know so like that's why I, like look I'm I'm, I'm thirty now I, look I, I take my time you know I take my time I told you like, I love sleeping you know what I'm saying. <laughs> Yeah, it, 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 like, this is, this is, this is, you know, I'm, I, I got so much grace for myself right now, you know, and I don't care what project it is, like, you know, uh, and this is, like, more sort of like a metaphor, but, the you know, first time I worked with uh, Spike Lee, uh, I was pa on, like, his movie, and I remember, the you know, first time he ever said anything to me, he was like, hey, go move that, and, like, I got up and ran, and I fell. Oh, oh. 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 And I fell, and like he just looked, and just like, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> so then, so then, so then somebody walked up to me and whispered in my ear, "Don't ever run, don't ever run for this stuff. Like, like you know, just like, you don't have to rush to like run and get it done. Like, and like that's just how I'm moving in my thirties. Is like, I don't care what the project is, you know, you're not gonna rush me to do anything. Like, you're not gonna make me ignore my family. You're not gonna make me, you know, miss out on." special moments and opportunities, like, because, like, I did a lot of that in my 20s when I was making Katrina Davis. I missed out on special moments. I was so locked in that, you know, I I was blocking almost everybody out, like, you know, not being kind to certain, like, relationships, you know what I'm saying? So, I think that that's what I would do different. Nothing on screen, because I, I love this project. To me, like, you know, you know, to me, like, the Oscars hit it on this this year, you know, because it's, it's a shame that you get nominated. I was like, that's all I was thinking. I was like, it's crazy, right? Yeah. But, but like that's because like the campaigning for the Oscars have gotten ridiculous, and I'm so glad that somebody finally wrote an article on it because it's like you need millions of dollars just to campaign, yeah. whatever. But we are we are campaigning right now and writing for the Emmys. Uh, we are you know submitting for like a few few different uh, categories. So y'all put some prayers up. Y'all you know you know become Academy voters and vote for us. Uh, but yeah, I'm I'm just not I'm not I'm not I'm not a uh, I'm, I'm way more graceful with myself. And final question. Um, so I'm a runner in Louisville. Um, I'm a psych pre-med major here at LSU, but I'm also a filmmaker. Oh. So right now I'm also a focused on documentary. And I wanted to know how you personally kept your organization up with these, because I know it's like stuff gets so messy sometimes. So like with myself and like the work that I've been working on with my crew, That's a really great question. That's a really uh, important question. So, when I was younger, um, I think I was a freshman, a freshman in college, and one of the things I learned was, you know, how to organize a hard drive. Like we learned that in class, and whenever I could, I, I got a new hard drive, and I backed. It was like I. I have Katrina Babies backed up at least 45 times. I have 
have so many hard drives that like now I be getting hard drives away like you know as as, as Christmas gifts, you know like like no <laughs> like, like why'd you give me a hard drive and I start trying to clean my apartment like but it's so important you know I, I'll tell you something that happened um, and like it was the devil for sure but when I first got in touch with time and they wanted to come on. Somebody, and like, I'm not gonna put it on blast, dropped my hard drive she and who broke it, it with all of Katrina babies on it. Ooh. And like, it was the only one that I had everything. And by the grace of God, I was able to send it off and get some of, some of it back. So like, they got moments in this film where like, where like you might see a glitch and it's because I, like that hard drive was dropped. Oh, wow. Right, so like, you know, like the footage was damaged, you know, and that taught me so much, you know, because imagine working <laughs> five, six years or something. Like, it was five years at the time. And then just like a simple mistake, just dropping it. Like it, 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 I was like, who do I call? Do I call the FBI? Like, who, like, 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 who, who do I call? So I want to encourage you now, if you are working on a documentary, Find a way to invest in like the best hard drives, just like you try to invest in like the best equipment and like secure like the best interviews. Get yourself a good hard drive and back everything up. I was told two times, back everything up three times. And put it in, I was uberly paranoid. Put it in three different places. I had a hard drive in my apartment, I had a hard drive in my mama house, and I would just like, you know, I would give a hard drive to my sister and like put it in like her dorm rooms. Like that's how hard up I was, you know? Um, so back everything up. As far as organizing, I can tell you how I like organize Katrina babies. Um, at the beginning, what I did was I just put the name of the person I interviewed and the date. And after each shoot, I did that. You know, you gotta be disciplined in this. Don't just shoot something and leave it on like on a card. Like shoot something, like whenever you shoot, you should be making it a habit that like clearing like the next two or three hours of your day or, or night to make sure that it's backed up. Because, and I'm not assuming that like, you know, you don't have a budget, but like if you don't have a budget, you can't afford a BIT. You know, somebody to back everything up for you on set and make sure everything is you know, like delivered to you, whatever. So you need to be disciplined and making sure that you are drop dumping and organizing everything after each shoot. And like, it's really important. Um, it's like one of the most important pieces like of this, you know, of this practice. So um, you can get more granular, you can get as grand, you know, as, as, as detailed and like specific as you like. You could, you know, organize things by names and uh, by, you know, by topics. And I just have to, you know, I have to give, give a shout out to like one of my students, Riley. Um, she has autism and She has like a really, like a really, 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 really good memory. And like, she like types super fast and uh, her mom asks, can she intern with me? So, and you know, because like, it was like hard for her to find work. You know what I'm saying? And she interned for me and you know, like she helped me like, so there's a moment in the film where like, um, at the end I'm interviewing like the yeah, school police officer and then he gets up and like I and like I say, come on, Riley, come on, Riley. And then like we run. That's me and her running with the camera. <laughs> Whatever. But as a part of her internship, and like I think that like you know, I'm hoping that she still uses this skill because her mom told me that like she was. But uh, she helped me organize my hard drive and like by by titles, by by you know by names, by topics, and. When I gave that hard drive to my AE, my uh, assistant editor, once we could afford one, you know, he was like, man, like, how the hell did you keep all of this organized? And, you know, Riley played a big part in that, you know? So shout out to Riley and, you know, like, shout out to all the students and people and children with autism because, like, you know, they can do just as much, just as much, you know? So, yeah. Let's get a final. Oh, okay. Go ahead. Oh, I, I promise I'll make this quick. I will make it quick. Hey, Mr. Buckley. Hey. Just wanted to say first, 
I love the animation because it reminded me of my favorite movie in the world, Jingle Jangle, mm-hmm. and, they, and how it. I didn't that, hear that a lot. Using that animation, it, it moved forward that part of the story that w- probably wouldn't have been appropriate for them to show mm-hmm. in, a, in a children's movie, yeah. but it allowed it to move forward. So I just wanted to say that. So I love that you used that in the movie. But my question is, okay, sorry, Dr. Winfield, for calling us out. We just did a project that we submitted for publication, but I know in my heart that that project is meant for more. I know it is. But I am not a filmmaker. Mm-hmm. How do you determine what's the best medium for impact? How do you figure that out? Damn. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I say that because like, when I first started, I never really thought about that. Cause like, I believed in like the story so much that I wasn't I wasn't rushing to just get it anywhere or like get it on the platform. Like I would have been okay if like I would have made this film and nobody was at my door and like I put it up on YouTube. That was my plan. Like I was recruiting this film for nine months and then put it on YouTube, right? But now that I have more knowledge, I think that it's important that you lean into the resources that are out there for filmmakers. Again, so many of us are new to these spaces and new to these, you know, these practices and art forums that we don't know what what um, you know resources exist and spaces exist. But a big reason that I was able to find a home for this was because, you know, I like I began to join these circles, right? So like the first circle I joined was the New Orleans Film Society. And the New Orleans Film Festival, and I signed up for fellowships. Um, and when I was an independent, I didn't really know how much that could impact me. But when I signed up for like a program called the Emerging Voices by the New Orleans Film Society, that introduced me to a whole new world that made me feel like I wasn't alone. Although I was an independent filmmaker, and like you know, I got a chance to do a speed pitching process, which is like pretty much like it's it's. It's structured like speed dating, but you do it with studios and funders. So I was able to talk to PBS and you know, uh, uh, you know, Chicken and Egg and uh, you know, oh, are you writing this down? <laughs> like, no, but 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 like, I, I I was able to talk to all of these different like you know like HBO and um, all of these different you know, just machines that are doing the work. So I knew that. I knew that there were more options than just YouTube. Mm-hmm. I think it's important that like, you lean into the resources that are out there for filmmakers, if, and filmmakers like you, filmmakers like ourselves. Mm-hmm. There are things that are dedicated just for you. Like I believe that chicken and egg is like only for black black women. I, I could be wrong, but yeah, but and, and I, I could be wrong, but there are things that are out there. So research, mm-hmm. you know, um, like don't try to do it all alone. Don't do what I did. <laughs> don't do what I did. Like I don't encourage that. Like lean into the resources that are out there. Find like your local film society or like the closest film society to you. In New Orleans, there's the New Orleans Film Society, and there's a program called the Emerging Voices, right? And in New York, there's Tribeca, and like they have their fellowships, and like you know, just you know, Google. Sometimes Google is really your best friend. Like you know, <coughs> fellowships for Black women. You know, fellowships for stories about disasters, fellow, like, you know, just like look those things up and apply. And those things will help you because like, sometimes we just don't know. So, you know, don't try to do it alone. Thank you all so much. I know I am, I'm so over my time, I'm so sorry. Um, But thank you for answering all of our questions and spending a little time. Um, As we close out this, and I know we have a couple other things Um, when people engage with your film, one thing we know about audience reception is sometimes when the film is done, when we're done with the film, the film ain't done with us, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. We're still working on the Preach. inside. Yeah. <laughs> um, what do you want the viewers and the audience to be left with? So this is the last question, final thoughts. What do you want them to be left with when they're done watching the film? Um, I know we talked a lot, at least earlier, about mental health and coping and the community. Um, that is all up and through the film, right? But what are those final thoughts that you want to sit with the people, especially those who are here? What do you want them to go away with? A 
few things. One, um, just because you think that a child is unaware or doesn't know what's going on or is too young to, you know, to really feel something, doesn't mean that that child shouldn't be equipped with the tools and the resources to deal with those situations and like that trauma whenever it surfaces later in their li lives. A big takeaway that I want people to have with this film is that, especially those in power and like especially adults and like especially those who work with children or have children, is that when a child experiences trauma, I don't care how, how old they are, you need to make sure that they have the tools and the resources to deal with it later. I don't care if it surfaces at 60. You know, don't leave that child on that island by themselves, right? That's one thing. Two, as an individual, don't ignore your trauma. You know, just because you think that like you're burying something, <laughs> or like just because you think that, you know, like you're, and like I still deal with this, you know, I've lost, like I'm, I'm, I'm still losing people and I have my process of dealing with it. And like I, I, I have a way of putting things like right here, and, and, and y'all know what I'm talking about. Like I, I put it right there because you can't put it nowhere else. Like you can't, you can't get it out of you. But even if you like, you know, forget about it, you know, for you know, for a little while, like you know, the the, the your body keeps score. and it's gonna hit you at the most unexpected time when you don't want it to happen. It might impact relationships. It might impact you know situations and jobs and you know who you are, mental health. So. The best thing you can do for yourself is like start addressing that stuff and find like a way to be gentle with yourself and not ignore like your experiences. And then three, you know, everything you love about New Orleans is because of the people you see in this film and like the people that this film represents. Um, and just because like on like the world news and like the local news, you see like Mardi Gras and French Quarter Fest and Jazz Fest and you and 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 you know every August they are talking about you know how much New Orleans is rebuilt. Mm -hmm. Don't forget about the people that really make up New Orleans, and we are the people who are like being pushed out, or they're trying to push us out. They would never get rid of us, right? Mm -hmm. But like we are the people who make up that make up that place. So make sure that when you think of New Orleans, you think of us. Make sure that when you do things for New Orleans, you do them for us. When you speak up about New Orleans and speak about New Orleans, you speak about us because everything you love is because of us, right? Um, so, yeah. And to the artists in the room, the uh, filmmakers in the room, you know, and all artists, I mean, and, you know, even people in, you know, aca you know academics, like, academia, yeah, exactly. Um, like I said earlier, use what you have and use what you have. Sometimes, you know, we focus so much on working up and, you know, and we focus on so much on getting like the best equipment, like the best teams that we don't look right next to, you, to, to us and work across. It was Issa Rae who said, you know, sometimes instead of working up, you gotta work across. Mm -hmm. You know, use what and who you have. You know, what and who you have. You know, so what what, what the pastor said, turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor? neighbor. That's it, you know, that's it. Right? That's it. That's what you got. Yep. <laughs> so yeah, and that's all I got. Thank y'all so much for being here, I appreciate it.
I scroll even see me shirts all day.